In France, a report says at least 25% of national debt is owned by Chinese investors, a figure that might cause concern for strategic interests in the future. NDD's France correspondent David Vives has a story. After castles, vineyards and airports, Chinese investors seem to have found something else to purchase in France. Public debt. According to a report published by an economic think tank, China owns at least 25% of France's public debt. For economist Philippe Erlin, this is in line with the CCP strategy to conquer Europe. We know for sure that China is buying what it can in European countries. They bought machinery companies in Germany, wines in France. It is like a market. They take what is best in each country. In September 2020, the French Minister of Economy and Finance said China's central bank was among the first to own France's debt. It says the pandemic, which triggered a 300% hike of France's public debt, could increase the scale of this issue. It also says the more debt China owns, the easier it will be for the CCP to influence France's politics and attitude toward China. The Minister of the Economy said in a report published this month on public debt, we have seen countries become dependent on their creditors. And there's also another problem, according to Erlen. Forced closures of many businesses and enterprises have resulted in many of those going bankrupt. And they too are being purchased by China. Some Chinese companies seem to have benefited from the economic crisis. In the U.S., we saw big tech companies benefit from the closures of small businesses. This is the same for China, which also increased its presence in Western countries. They are now able to purchase at very low cost any assets in France or in other countries, which they do. NTD reached out to the think tank about who exactly owns the public debt. The director said she asked the same question to the Ministry of Economy but hasn't received an answer. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. The long-awaited study on the origin of COVID-19 is out. The WHO says it's likely that animals were the source of the CCP virus. NTD Miguel Moreno has more on the results and the international response. Where did the Chinese Communist Party virus come from? The World Health Organization's investigative team says the lab origin theory is extremely unlikely. And in their now published results, they say the zoonotic transmission theory is likely to highly likely. So in sum, they say the virus most likely transferred from an animal to a human, causing the deadly and devastating economy-crushing pandemic we're in today. WHO's Peter Emberic led the mission. Apart from, from that idea that yeah, there is a lab nearby or several labs nearby in the same city, so there must be a, a link. Uh, apart from that, nobody has been able to pick up any, uh, any firm um, uh, arguments or proof or evidence. China gave him and the rest of his team permission to enter the country a year after the outbreak began. But the U.S. says China withheld important data. The Department of Justice, alongside Australia, the UK, and several other countries say they're concerned about the study. Here's a line from their joint statement. We support a transparent and independent analysis and evaluation free from interference and undue influence of the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic. But the statement wasn't a demand or a request. The WHO director says the study doesn't mark an end to the investigation, just an important start. On Tuesday, the U.S. State Department released its first human rights report. Secretary of State Antony Blinken highlighted several countries in his remarks, including China and Burma. Secretary Blinken released the 2020 country reports on human rights practices at the State Department Tuesday afternoon. This is the department's 45th such annual report to Congress. The trend lines on human rights continue to move in the wrong direction. This year's report details the Chinese Communist regime's extensive human rights abuses. It says the regime committed genocide and crimes against humanity in the last year, against Uyghurs and other minority groups in Xinjiang. Activists and some organizations continue to accuse the regime of forcibly harvesting organs from prisoners of conscience, including Falun Gong practitioners and Muslim detainees in Xinjiang. The report also listed significant human rights issues in Hong Kong. 
In his remarks, Blinken highlighted that recently Burma's military have beaten, imprisoned and killed nonviolent protesters. He talked about how to use a broad range of tools to stop abuses and hold perpetrators to account. One way to do that is by working with the United States Congress, which has passed laws providing new authorities to sanction human rights violators, things like the Global Magnitsky Act, the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, other pieces of important legislation. Blinken says it's much more effective when the United States speaks out and works with other like-minded countries to protect human rights, such as its recent work with Canada, the European Union, and the United Kingdom on individuals engaged in atrocities in China's Xinjiang. Former President Donald Trump launches a new website. It's dedicated to preserving the legacy of his administration. The website says that the office of Donald J. Trump will continue to advance the America First agenda. The website's About page celebrates the former president's legacy on key policy issues. It mentions his handling of the CCP virus pandemic, securing the southern border, and the peace deals in the Middle East. The 45office.com website was registered a week before Trump departed the White House, but the page remained blank until Monday. DonaldJTrump.com was also revamped. The two sites marked Trump's first digital footprints after social media giants banned him. And in other news, a famed Hollywood cinema is finally welcoming audiences again, and monster films are to return to the big screen there. Hollywood's most iconic cinema, the TCL Chinese Theater, announced its reopening on Monday. A host of monster movie directors, including Michael Doherty and Adam Wingard, cut the red ribbon in the courtyard to mark the occasion. Wingard's film, Godzilla vs. Kong, will be the first film shown at the theater. He said audiences are in desperate need of a distraction. It's been such a depressing year, 2020, and coming into 2021, that I think it's just time for us to be able to just turn our brains off and let a big Hollywood popcorn spectacle just do the, do the work for us. And, you know, it's really just about having fun and, you know, cutting loose and just being with a group of friends and family. Michael Doherty wrote the story for Godzilla vs. Kong. He described how the spirit of the film mirrors our collective experience during the pandemic. It feels like we're living in the aftermath of a giant monster attack. You know, we've all been huddled in our homes, taking very extreme precautions, dealing with this bizarre, surreal, collective tragedy, global tragedy. Um, it feels like we're all sort of living in a Godzilla or King Kong film. The TCL Chinese Theater was first opened in 1927 and is located in the center of the Hollywood Walk of Fame. For the reopening, the theater will space guests apart with plexiglass between seats and will sanitize between screenings. Many are shocked to see Disney thanking Chinese Communist Party organizations accused of human rights abuses. It was because they allowed Disney to shoot its recent film Mulan in Xinjiang, China. Entities Don Ma brings us more on how Hollywood studios are yielding to the regime. No, 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 this is just the way it works. If you want to get your product and service into China, you got to appease the government. You got to make sure the CCP is okay with what your product and service is. Fenton is known for movies like 2013's Iron Man 3 and 2012's Looper. He detailed his own experiences on how Beijing can influence a Hollywood film. In the case of Looper, we actually took a movie that was supposed to take place in the future in France, and we actually altered it so that in the future it took place in China. And not only did we alter it so it took place in China in the future, but we worked with the Chinese municipal government to actually design the skyline of Shanghai in the way they envisioned Shanghai looking 40 years in the future in the way he says that in the movie the Chinese state wanted to make Shanghai look like the most technologically advanced city on earth we were essentially showcasing China as a brand in the movie itself and showcasing China as the place where everybody wanted to be no matter where they lived in the world and most people that watched the film never even realized that they were actually seeing ingredients of Chinese propaganda in the film. He reveals that many film studios are actually proactively yielding to China's demands. 
But there's lots of cases now where studios are actually placating the CCP and then also working with the Chinese government to actually portray Chinese in a certain way, staying away from sensitive topics, whether it's Tibet or Taiwan or Hong Kong or the Uyghur atrocities, whatever it is, there's a real... Fenton believes that the only way Hollywood can push back against Chinese influence is if the industry boycotts the Chinese market. And it's strength in numbers. And if suddenly the populace of China can't get access to any Hollywood content or anything from the West that has that cultural fabric, the Chinese government will have to relent and retreat. Now the recent wave of boycotts targeting Western brands in China may soon lose steam. That's what the president of the EU Chamber of Commerce in China predicts. And today's Tiffany Meyer has the details. The recent wave of boycotts targeting Western brands in China may soon lose steam. That's what the president of the EU Chamber of Commerce in China predicts. Lately, the Chinese regime's Communist Youth League and the military have criticized several foreign clothing brands. That's because these brands said they won't use cotton from China's Xinjiang region. They said it concerns over forced labor. Most of the companies I know actually had excellent business afterwards again. The Chinese customers love European products and brands. H&M and Nike are some of the brands facing boycotts. Some landlords shut down their physical stores. Some of China's largest e-commerce companies, ride-hailing apps and online maps, removed those brands from their platforms. The Chinese Foreign Ministry on Tuesday dodged a question asking if the regime is behind the boycotts. The spokeswoman claims Chinese consumers have what she calls freedom of choice. It's not the first time the CCP promoted anti-foreign narratives to shift people's attention away from domestic issues. Many believe the 2012 anti-Japan protests were meant to shift discussions away from CCP's officials' corruption cases and China's economic downturn. But the regime soon pulled back when protests went out of control. The EU official also says despite seemingly aggressive sanctions towards the EU last week, the regime is trying to separate human rights from trade. He says he was seated next to a provincial party secretary at the event last week. And this shows the regime values him. The EU official says the CCP was hitting on NGOs, public opinion leaders in Europe at the same time still courting and rolling out red carpet for European business. That's the news for today and thanks for tuning in. I'm Stuart Lees.